Good afternoon, and uh, once again, I want to welcome all of you to our Maniac Talks. Uh, as always, I'm um, excited and honored, of course, to introduce and welcome our speaker, uh, Dr. Belay Dimos, who is a professor in the Department of Physics and director of the Joint Center for Earth Systems Technology. We usually call it JSET which is a cooperative center between UMBC and NASA, Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, Belai will share some wisdom uh, that he has gathered over many years uh, to people who are just starting out. And I'm sure the young folks who are probably somewhere wondering where was Belai 30 or, 30 or 40 years ago. So we're gonna hear a little bit of that today. More specifically, how did he get here from Eritrea? Eritrea is a small country, as some of you may not know where it is, but he's going to show you where it is. So how did he get here from there? You know, that's interesting. Uh, what steps uh, did he take to get, uh, to get here? And how did he get involved in what he's doing now? It's amazing, you know? And then what excites him about it? What keeps him going? So interesting. And for the younger one, of course, I want to remind them this is not a traditional uh, talk, science talk, where people have to talk about the science, this is about the journey. So Belai is going to walk us on his journey, all the way from Eritrea to here, and becoming who he is today. So ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome our speaker, Belai Demos. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know how to start. I feel like this is when you get invited to give this talk. And hopefully it is not. Several years ago, uh, I had a chance to collaborate with uh, an author about what are balloons. And the idea, the goal of this was for middle school students. They want to see what, what is a scientist, you know, uh, what do you do as a scientist? So, they asked me a couple of pictures, and I gave them several, so they chose these two. This is me. Uh, this is my sister who graduated then, so uh, Asmara University. And this is in uh, Barbados, doing research, of course. <laughs> and so my wife and three kids in there. So, um, when Charles said, you need to give us a talk, I say, my God, ah, where did this time go? So I started to worry about, okay, what am I going to talk about? Um, one third, I'm an Eritrean, but I've only lived one third of my life there. And that is, uh, uh, most of it I've lived it here, but I'm still um, stamped with an Eritrean stamp. That's the formative years. And I said, okay, maybe I'll give them a little bit of um, what was life till I come in here. I'll give you a little bit of my graduate school coming to NASA and then leaving NASA. And then lessons learned and coming back to NASA again. So, um, but I want to give you you know, when I call my parents back home, they say, oh, so-and-so is in America, please say hi and tell them to call back. <laughs> and I don't know where in America, okay? So a lot of people also tell me, oh, I have a friend from Africa, so you, maybe you know him. <laughs> so I saw this in the Economist uh, magazine where you've got United States, China, Japan, India, Eastern Europe, and a lot of the European countries, and they are still less than the area of Africa. Okay? So, and I'm right at that corner of probably the smallest country in Africa, is Eritrea. So, I grew up in Asmara. Uh, this, is, this is the Rift Valley, the Red Sea, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, uh, Ethiopia. I was born in Addis, but I, uh, my dad was in the military, so he was going all over. 
So I started school in Asmara. So I thought I'll give you this. And since this is Goddard, and I see Africa huge in there, you see a big part of it is desert. And I come from right there where this is an NDVI image that where the desert and the green are always fighting. Okay? So that means, uh, well, and as you can see, this is the Suez Canal, and a lot of oil is here. So somebody has to control that pass. Okay? So we had so many bosses. The Egyptians, the Turks, and the Italians took over. And then the British came for 15 years. Then the Ethiopians took over. Um, in 91, we became independent. Okay, so through all that time, a lot of civil strife. Okay? Add to it um, drought. Okay, so I'll show you in a little bit. So, Climate change or weather, it doesn't matter whether you're rich, poor, you see it, you react to it. It's a direct reaction. When I teach, I taught a climate change course and I asked them, how does climate change affect you? So I asked them to write one page, it's a graduate student, and they were struggling to find something that it really impacts them. It's here. For us, we live through it. So, okay. So my life through the uh, Darwin, the Southern uh, uh, Oscillation Index. So, 1890, I have put in the significant years with green in here, and uh, this is my, we go by first name basis. You cannot trace the DeMoss family back home. Everybody goes, you know, if I go back home, people call me by first name, by my dad's first name, maybe the village where I come from. So I go by Bella, Ibrahana, DeMoss. These are all given names to me, to my dad, and to my grandpa. Notice that I only am talking about grandfathers, men. Even when you teach your kids, you only teach them, this is your father, this is your grandpa. So I've been trying to reconstruct where were the, the grandmas. Past my grandma, it's really hard to find it. Okay, so this is how we go about. And um, okay, before 1890, when we talk about Eritrea, it's diffuse, there's no borders there. And the king there was Minalik II. He traces his ancestry back to the Solomon's uh, Jewish migration. Okay, so Queen Sheba. And, and then his daughter became, uh, uh, succeeded him. And then some palace intrigue. And then the Emperor Haile Selassie comes in. And then he was, there was a coup there. Then we started from emperor so-and-so. We started talking about comrade so-and-so. So that's Mengistus. I put red because those are the regions where a lot of heartache happened. Okay? And we we'll become independent. So I tried to relate it to the climate. Um, Diffuse boundary, then this is a colonial scramble. Eritrea became an Italian colony in 18, uh, somewhere around here. And then the Ethiopians took over Eritrea independence in here. So what happened 1896? This is when Demos was born. There was a cattle plague, just destroyed all the cattle there. He came from India with, uh, with some of the soldiers because they used to bring a lot of cattle to feed the soldiers. Okay? 
And then the Battle of Adwa, probably the only battle where a European power was defeated by an African country, happened in 1896. And the only way they could defeat this power was by sheer number. That means every male has to go fight. Uh, and cholera was rampant. And the only way you deal with this drought was in there. This is 1896. If you look at El Nino oscillation, that's when it comes. And so because of this loose border, people were moving and doing that mitigation. And so my grandfather was born because two families immigrated to a, a fertile place. And they went back to where they came from. So he was uh, raised by a single mom. The only occupation that he had was to become an Italian soldier. And he fought in Tripoli. And the stories from there is, you say, they would put us up front when they were fighting the Allied, but they would take the shoes away. In the desert sand, it's really hard to run away. And so a lot of them, you know, he was one of the luckiest who came. And so you can see, this is where my dad was born. I put it here. How many of you know this Sinclair Oil Company? They were prospecting for oil in Ethiopia in the 40s. So when all Italian colonies became independent, Libya, Somalia, um, John Foster Dallas, Dallas Airport, and the US vetoed that independence because they did not want to deal with two countries to stretch a pipeline to the Red Sea. Because they have to deal with Ethiopia and Eritrea as an independent country. So it's, so every time I uh, go to Oklahoma to do research, I look at the Sinclair company and say, no, 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 I'm not buying gas here. I go to Exxon. I don't know, Exxon might be doing similar things now, but I don't know, so it just makes me feel a little bit better. Um, so I was born here, and my time was, if you look at time, it's time of coup d'etats, time of drought, time of war. And I left right in here, this is, so, Drought index, if you look at it, the 74 was really bad, and 84 was terrible. So for me, climate has a very direct impact, and all I have done seems to be to mitigate that. So if I, I gave this um, talk on the climate that uh, was graduate students, part of it. So if you look at here, there was uh, scarcity in rain, free movement, even the colonial war strategy for the tribes, the people was just small adjustment, move to, you know, intermarriage, things like that. You go to an area where they have green and you give them your daughter and they can feed your cattle until your rain comes. So this is the strategy then. Um, Fairly good rains here. Uh, I take the case of my dad. He, um, it's actually reversed me. He came here, studied, and he had no reason to stay here, so he went back. Here, this is me. Uh, if you see, the, the rains have really substantially going bad. They put it red and fight or f flight. And this is where the independence movements were going in. So I was not bold enough to go fight. My only way out is just run. So it looks like, I, as, uh, that's something that 
you know, um, some of my closest friends say, you always run. So you could see a little bit of that through what I did. Okay, that's my background, my climate, my, how it affected me. So just a little bit of this. My dad only went to fourth grade. The Italians told that if you teach them, they can take over. So by rule, you're only allowed to go to fourth grade. But the fourth grade then is equivalent to probably better than high school now. Okay, and so he, he rose through the ranks and uh, became police chief for the region. Um, this is something good and bad with me. There were a lot of folks that were brought from third world countries and they go to Fort Bragg here and there was something called like a police academy, not the movie. But there was a real police academy, so he went through all of that, and he did um, his thesis was against a red insurgency because the U.S. was so worried the Russians are going to come and take all Africa, so that was their standing. So in '74, though the coup, so his son became one of really good fighters for freedom. And he is a police chief, he was, uh, the only thing he has is to resign. Okay, my uh, older brother who passed away fighting was, I used to call him Mao, but good and bad, because he would not let me listen to any of the BBC, any of the, you study, that's it. So it helped me. Um, my hometown right now, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Town. It's very beautiful, very nice weather. And I lived close to Kanyo Station. This is American base. So as a child, I used to watch football and I say, that's crazy. How could they do this? <laughs> uh, my favorite shows were I Dream of Genie and Mission Impossible, because they bring it, and I'm right close, so we used to. So, I, don't, I went to mission school, Lutheran school, up to the three, point, you know, three and a half grades, skipped off most of fourth and fifth grade. If you do well, the first two ranks, you can pass. Um, seventh and eighth grade, it was an active war, so I, basically don't remember much of it. Except I got an F for drawing a really nice horse and painting it green. So he said, this green horses don't exist. So <laughs> that I remember. Um, high school was, it, pa it passed fast. This is a really, really tough year for Eritrea. Okay. So, uh, undergraduate, you have to take school living certificate, call it SAT. Um, when I took it, 106,000 people took this exam. This is the entire Ethiopia. And there are only 2,000 spaces. It's a miracle how I made it. So I just, um, and I did not want to measure physics at all. I hated physics because I didn't take any physics in high school. But uh, the teachers are really good. The physics professors are just excellent. They come from Max Planck Institute in IIT. Because we were under the communist rule, they would bring them from GDR. Uh, and they are just wonderful. But we're not. Um, so my f first, we started 30 students. My first three tests were zero out of 15, zero, zero out of 15, and zero out of 15. So don't give up. And um, a good friend told me I used to play soccer competitive on a national level. He said, look, you play really good soccer. You've got the brains, so you're going to study with me. 
and he just got released from a murder uh, conviction. And so I'm, what am I going to say? Of course, yes. <laughs> and in the dorm, it's a bunk bed, and he sits on the lower one, I, uh, he sleeps on the lower one, I sleep on the top. So he made me study with him, and then I was one of six who graduated. The rest were all, you, we called the um, Christmas massacre. The first Christmas, almost 60% are dismissed because there are no jobs if they graduate here. Okay, so my first break, we're interviewing for graduate research assistant. So I feel like a weasel when I tell this story. And then the interviewers are from Germany. No, they said, that was 1984, uh, the communist bloc has boycotted the Los Angeles Olympics. So after they asked me a lot of questions, the last question was, did we do right? Did the USSR right? Well, of course, what would you say? <laughs> yes, and a guy who was ahead of me by 0.02 in my GPA, Joseph said, no. Guess who they hired? <laughs> so when, when you're faced with these questions, answer it the right way. It doesn't mean you sold out. So I, okay? So that's how it happened. So that's my undergrad years. Uh, 84, 86, as a graduate assistant. We did a lot of things, but what made me think that I have to leave this country was, um, you know, you always get involved in things. So we were sent for sort of hard labor in to southern Ethiopia. Very, very rough place for three months. And that just, I decided, okay. This is time to leave. I wasn't going to the freedom movement. Uh, my only alternative is to look for a way out. So um, looked for ads. Cloud seeding seems to be a good thing. Uh, you know, there is this, what is education for? If you're in the West, you, it's to grow personally, to be an, a good citizen. If you're raised in the East, it, it, it has to produce, it has to help the community, it has to. So, you know, through college years, that formative years, you're always being told you're learning so you can help your community. So that doesn't leave you, okay? So I said, okay, cloud seeding, this is great, so I can make it rain and uh, come back. And that's what I did. Um, because I'm an Eritrean, it, it's really hard to leave the country because you have to go to Addis and apply. So I was allowed $50 only. And then my, um, my family's house is as a collateral. If I don't come back, they lose everything. So my dad said, go. I mean, we will find a way. And so that's, you know, in every one of this, I told you about the college student who said, you got to study and this. These are things that shape how you react to people. So, came to UNR. Um, UNR is a really good place, University of Nevada, Reno. The degrees in physics, in the, in the physics department, Desert Research Institute is just a wonderful place to study. Reno is a good place to live. And most of it is uh, microphysics. John Hallett, the hallett Mosso processes, uh, Jim Telford, the stochastic rain theory, uh, Fred Rogers, a lot of the instrumenting. Sean Tomi used to stop by to give us lectures. They were all friends. And a lot more. 
So the Sierra Nevada Cooperative Pilot, this is weather seeding. They would seed the Sierra clouds, increase the water. Okay, so I came in near the end of this, but got involved in this. So John Harlett is from uh, UK. He said, Demos, now we wanted to see if those schools are any good. That's why we admitted you. Thank you. <laughs> and so I found out that I was the first black uh, PhD in the At the time, I wasn't sure, and I'm glad I didn't know because, but later on, I talked to the chair, now uh, Professor Neil. He said, yeah, yeah, you were the first one. But um, talking to John, he said, you didn't disappoint, you know, we invited, we admitted a lot more after you. There's several, so it, it takes a toll. Uh, anyone who knows Reno uh, uh, has a very tough police force because the casinos are there and they don't want any problems. So it's just if you drive to the wrong side of the city, it's is the west side, for sure you're gonna be asked. And to complicate that, DRI used to be the state campus, used to be to a job corp, a training center. And so they're not allowed, those students have to stay there. So here is me driving around, and so it was uh, lots of stories that. But um, memories, John Hallett, he would take us on a hike and would see a cloud and he would tell us something and then and said, make sure you submit your test. And I said, what test? That was a test. I think the best way to learn is to go on a hike with him. You know, Mount Rose, the Donner Pass, all those things. Um, Telford, I don't know how to say this. <laughs> Jim Telford, Tel Dr. Telford is if you come from a third world country, professors are your gods. You stand up before the, uh, they tell you to sit down. You, they come into class and every one of us will stand up and say, you may sit down. And I said, so here I come. And um, when he talks to you, he doesn't pull punch. But actually that helped me. He said, uh, I'm, I have to take a computer programming course. It's much more advanced level. And he said, uh, have you had any computer experience? I said, no. Have you done programming? No. Have you seen a computer? Yes. Have you touched a computer? No. <laughs> and he just cursed. And any other teacher would say, don't take it. But I had two weeks. He said, okay, come to my office. He gave me books and he said, program, Fortran programming. Yeah. Coming from a third world country, I, you know, I've seen professors. They come in at nine, they go to coffee at 10, <laughs> they go to lunch. I said, ah, this is not gonna be hard. But he comes in at eight, he's got a peanut butter sandwich, He's sitting there and I said, when is he going to get up? <laughs> the first day, it was 10 p.m. when we left. He bought my first lunch because I thought I would walk and get something. And for two weeks, I went through this and um, I was able to take that course. But I think I've seen much more, you know, I've come, I've, come prepared all my life through all those turmoils, I think I felt like. But he was the most concerned about the well-being of his stu the students, but he doesn't show it. And I hear stories from others that he was, when he reviews NSF proposals, he's brutal. But he can take the same. 
Uh, so just briefly, I did, um, you know, in the Sierra, when they do the seeding, they look at aircraft images of ice crystals. They're clean. But when you look at uh, ground-based, they're very rhymed. There's a lot of water in them. So where is this water was the question I was given. And that's my first time to see snow. So spent a lot of fun years. This is an image from, um, from one publication. This is oxygen isotope ratio. It's a function of temperature. So if you take a sample and look at where most of that sample came from, it tells you the temperature range. It was before the flight clearance for the aircrafts. And that's when uh, DRI lost several scientists for uh, icing accident at the time. It was a really excellent scientist. So I spent a lot of time uh, in mountains, in snow. I learned to ski. Um, there's a chapter on uh, Elizabeth's uh, book, Threading on Thin Air, chapter seven, talks a lot about the graduate students. Um, uh, Renny Zhang, Professor Renny Zhang at Texas A&M uh, was my classmate. So we were asked to take a huge snow separator to Mount Rose, but we forgot to take snowshoes or skis. So we're carrying it and sinking, and <laughs> that was, uh, she talks a lot about that, but what I want to tell you is this hands-on, like the OLEDs guys that you're doing, that's the best way to teach students. Just put them in the field, work through it. Uh, this is an aircraft uh, at NCAR, chill radar. I mean, that's what I remember. Okay. Uh, and then I graduated. I had to decide. So I had three chances. Stay at DRI, go to, uh, then they were forming this um, institute, clouds, climate, something, scripts, uh, and then uh, University of Illinois. I chose Illinois because of these two, Randy Boris and Melanie Watzel. They were there. They're the best mentors you can have. And they said, go there. And I was ready to leave DRI by then, five years. Um, the reason I chose it was I've always wanted to go back home and do that cloud seeding experiment. So I wasn't looking for permanent place. And this job allowed me to travel all across the US, and that was fun. I, Mount Mitchell, most of it is um, looking at cloud water content, the fog. You know, trees stay immersed in fog almost 30 to 40% of their time. So cloud chemistry is important. So we built an uh, instrument. This is a Caltech uh, cloud water connector. So we have to choose the roads in here, what site they should be, how they collect the water, all that stuff. So it helped me see the country and gave me two years of time to think, OK? And I met, I met my wife, and I just said, okay, forget about drought. <laughs> and this is a picture from building 22 when I came here. Uh, Kathy, where's Kathy? Kathy gave me. Um, I accepted two positions. One was at CSU with uh, Jeff and Sonia, because we were all moving from Illinois to CSU. And then I came to tell my wife that I'm going there. She was going to school here. And then I got a call saying, somebody wants to interview you here. So she drove me all the way to here to do an interview, and she didn't want to go to Fort Collins. So Harvey Melfi, Dave Starr, 
or into being me? And I say, when can you start? So, you know, with my English, I'm starting to say, August 22, I am going to go somewhere. But then Harvey said, great, August 22 then. <laughs> and I'm thinking, <sighs> so in my mind, I'm conflicted. My wife will be happy here. Uh, so that's why I didn't object to it. So um, my second conference in San Francisco, you know, uh, I was in cloud physics, snow, things like that. So I tend to be an outlier. You don't see a lot of black people doing cloud seeding and on the snow. Uh, second conference, <laughs> this guy comes and he say, what's your research? Tell me about it. You know, he doesn't have to do that. He was just walking from the stairs. And uh, you know David, I, hopefully he's not here. He's retiring, having fun. And Dave Starr is somebody you will not forget. And he didn't remember, but during that interview, all I told was my second conference in cloud physics. So I just felt, and, and my wife was going to school here, so what would you choose for the youngsters? And I did a lot of um, field work, uh, water vapor variability, this kind of stuff, yeah. So one of my favorite uh, experiment was IHOP, International H2O Project in 2002. It allowed me to, uh, Keys probably remembers this, um, you know, just allowed me to go out and network. So, after I did that, um, you can remember, this is a, we were in the middle of the Oklahoma panhandle. So before the experiment, I had to go prospect for a site. And if you see, there is, the houses are a mile apart. And Sunday, most of them are at church. I have forgotten this. So I'm driving, and then I would knock, and the dogs would come. It's just, it was hard to find a place. Then I, uh, Bill Brown at NCAR, he had fortunately found a place. Um, so we got there. It rained, and we were all stuck. This is uh, Kevin Knapp's instrument. So we went into the ditch. And then the guy who came to help us, what this black guy with the mohawk. So I wasn't sure, you know, you don't see many of them there. And I was saying, man, this is different. So I, I you know, my culture, I come from a very conservative uh, uh, Greek Eastern Orthodox. So you really have to make them work together. If you're going to be serious about religion, I was, so I said, this is a message. At that time, I've been steering. And that's the first time I saw the inside of a, a police car. A 3 a.m., $250 ticket for speeding. I think it was 65 on a 53, 55, something like 63 on a 55. And by this time, I'm thinking, shh, why me? Um, so, uh, you know, returning to Eritrea is out. So I have to rethink. And that was um, an interesting time. So I applied uh, around 2005 for a NAFP administrator's fellow. Uh, two years, you go out. It gives you time to rethink. I made really great friends there. I see one sitting in the back. Um, so I, um, 
I said, OK, what's missing? So you, I tend to reset myself every seven years or so. And I said, what's missing? This is what was missing. I've seen a lot of people retire from Goddard. This is something that uh, I would like. If I had a hand to change, maybe management is listening. You know, we go to the rec center, thank you, thank you, and after that, you don't see them here. They don't come to mentor, they don't come to interact with that. So I've seen a lot of them, but you go to a university, the students are graduating, you know, they invite you to their wedding, to their firstborn. The life is, and probably knows this. So you're alive, it tells you you are making it a dent, you're changing things, but you know this. So that was missing with me. So I just said, okay, we're gonna do something and um, we organized the experiment called WAVES at the Howard University here, not far. Um, a lot of interaction. Cassie is now a NOAA employee. Um, Brown is, these are all PhDs, and we had a great help from Mike, Jack, Mike King, you know, I just, um, Ann Thompson. This is an experiment that we did, and it happened to be the first experiment, large scale, in an HBCU. Historically black colleges and universities. So it was very <coughs> satisfying to me to do that. Um, and a little bit of the science. You know, radio sounds, you put them all in parallel, you know, in one balloon and you release them, you see the variability. This is relative humidity of one, two, three, four, five, six different vendors. So we release this thing and we're trying to come up with a 0.1 degree centigrade per decade as a climate signal of the tropospheric warming. Right? So that is just, so um, this led to, uh, well, not led, but this helped the site to become one of the reference sites for um, Gruan. The Gruan is uh, upper air renaissance. And so that's the only university operated we get a lot of help from Goddard, from NOAA, but that's the only university operated site. Okay? So it's five miles from here. So that is something satisfying. And I think beyond that is also um, the interaction you get with, you know, I made a lot of friends, scientists, students. Um, so, it has been very successful, okay? So, so the goal of that side is to contribute to science, to diversity, without compromising the science, okay? I, I would love to increase the output, okay? Um, just to give you a little bit, in here, for example, if you see 2006, 2011, there were less than 10 PhD. This is African Americans or Hispanics. If you take the entire universities in the US, within that time, that program surpassed it. This is writing grants, helping somebody to advise the students. So it takes a lot of work. And I think thanks to Noah also who funded this. So if you see, it's a real impact. And that's actually, um, at AMS, if you go to AMS, go to the color of weather night. There's a reception on Sundays. When I started going to AMS, it was Marshall Shepard, Greg Jenkins. There's about six of us, we would go into the lobby of a bar and talk. Now it's a ballroom. So a lot of 
um, and in the science. I mean, Beltsville have done quite well so far, and we'll see. But um, my time is about going, so I'll leave room for some questions. I've been lucky, very lucky. Um, but I think I could do better. That's the message that I tell myself. Um, and so issues are everywhere. You run from Eritrea, you come to Reno. From Reno, you run to Washington. You run to Howard. You run. Um, there's issues everywhere. Okay. So I say Howard, Howard does have a diversity problem. It's the other way around. Yeah. So. You have to find a path through all this to succeed. Um, I think that's pretty much what I did. Um, <coughs> help could come from a place where you least expect it, if I leave you. So be open. Um, don't abandon your core beliefs. Usually you find ways to do it. Keep trying. There's a lot of good people around you. OK? Uh, my, uh, there's a song, the young ones who probably, when you're custom made, you don't need to fit in. Okay? Uh, there's always, oh, a scientist. As a scientist, I have to do this. I have to do this. Uh, just create your own path. And um, where am I now? I'm at JSET. I really, um, JSET gave me a boost by allowing me to teach and build that side of my resume, go to Howard. And then um, they were looking for a director. They were looking for a physics person who is a professor in physics department. Departments are funny. Um, so they tend to be territorial. So they are looking for a physics professor, somebody who has maybe Goddard experience, JSET experience, UMBC. And then how many people are there? Very few. Mostly atmospheric science researchers come from civil engineering, from atmospheric science. There are, uh, DRI has a physics department with atmospheric research and UMBC, I, I think maybe one or two more. So there are very few of so, so I am adjacent. Hopefully, uh, I think I will end it here. Hopefully I gave you an idea of how culture, climate, and things intertwine mingle to make somebody. Sorry if I bore you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so we have time for question, comment at this time. Yep. Um, I thought you were going to talk about lessons learned. What lessons have you learned over the years? The last. Um, you know, uh, advice can come from any corners. Those were the lessons learned. For me, is uh, there's a lot of help around you. It's just a matter of finding it. When Harvey was retiring, we were at um, Ponca City at the diner. And he said, Balai, I'm going to retire from NASA and go to UMBC. I've decided. And for me, having uh, somebody, Harvey, talking to me like that is, I was just studying, it's big. So it, it might not be uh, that important to you, me, but for the young person who listens, you don't know which one he will latch into. So just treat them a day. So that's probably. Um, and I've gotten help from uh, all people you may not assume. Uh, Ejigud, my uh, college dorm, yeah, nobody was talking to him.
because there everybody was afraid. Oh, he just came out of prison. And you wouldn't expect him, but I think if I see the main person who made a change in my life is him. I would have dropped out. Three zeros in your major is big. So, yeah. A question for coming up here. Yeah. So what happened to your family home? <laughs> yeah, thanks for asking. Um, I graduated in 92, and we became independent in 91. So the government said all agreements are that with the previous government are null and void. But to go from master's to PhD, John Hallett wrote a lot of letters. So, yeah, I got lucky. Yeah. Okay, so let's thank Philae one more time. Thank you.